So last Sunday afternoon, uh, like many of you, I think, we had an, we had an Easter dinner uh, with our family, and it was an Easter dinner at our house. Uh, it was great to see the cutest 16-month-old child in the world uh, and have her running around our living room. And around uh, 4.30 or 5, after all the family had left, I, Susan and I were cleaning up, and I you know, gathered up the, the tablecloth and took it out in the back porch and was shaking the crumbs out of it so, you know, we could wash it sometime this week. And as I was standing there shaking it out, I looked, I looked through our, at our backyard and then I looked at the alley and I looked at, across the alley and, you know, there, there it was, you know, the apartment building across the alley, uh, the big white wall was where it was tagged was still there with the graffiti. Uh, you know, there were still the 14 blue recycling barrels on either side of the alley, one of which was tipped over and it still had been tipped over, remained tipped over. There was still the dumpster and the, and the green barrels. Uh, and as, as I shook out the tablecloth, I thought, well, we had a good Sunday morning. You know, Colleen had a really good sermon. The music was okay. And, uh, you know, the crowd was great. And, and, um, and I thought, but what has changed? Has anything changed? Uh, the graffiti's still there. The dumpsters are still there. It's still cold. What, what has changed? And I thought, you know, how did the disciples feel on after, after the resurrection, did they, did they have the same issue? Okay, but what's different? What's different? In Acts, Luke records two behavioral changes in the community after the resurrection. The first is unity in the midst of diversity. And the second is generosity in the midst of poverty. The unity in the midst of diversity. Luke begins by saying, And all who believed in the Lord Jesus were of one heart and mind. They had unity. You know, and you think about the early, early church, it was, it, was, uh, it was a diverse group. Uh, you know, Paul describes it as slave and free, Jew and Greek, uh, free uh, and, and slave, and, and male and female. So it was a diverse group that was pulled together that normally wouldn't have been together. Unity is different than unanimity. Unanimity is everybody thinking alike, dressing alike, acting alike. Um, you know, often it's like a Russian election or an Egyptian election. Everybody votes the same way. You know, it's 100% voted for this candidate. Uh, and you know when there's unanimity, probably the opposition has been silenced. I'm always scared when there's unanimity in a church vote. Um, it, it means somebody has been silenced or driven away. Unity says... We might disagree, but we'll hold together because we respect each other and we value each other. And you're important to the whole group, even though we might disagree. <clears throat> when a group has unity, it has a common focus, a common purpose, a common goal. You know, in the early church, the common goal was spreading the love of Jesus. Now, not always is the common goal helpful or good or wise. I mean, you can be united and be racist. You can be united and be in the Klan, or you could be united and be in the Nazis. 
But a common goal creates unity because we're all going for the same purpose and the same vision. When um, I was dating Susan, I had a 65 Chevelle that was about 10 years old. And it was dented and the defroster didn't work and the radio didn't work, but it was my car. And it was missing a hubcap. And, it was, uh, yeah. and, and I, it, I always referred to it as my car. And I noticed after dating her for a while, I started to refer to it as our car. And I realized that there was something now going on that was significant between me and Susan because I had moved from my to our. And I'd moved from thinking about I to we. And I think when we, there is unity, we move from that I to we. And we move from my to our. It's, it's our church. It's, it's our project. And we might disagree, but we're moving toward a larger purpose. Now, when we have that thinking of our, we're much more likely to be generous. I mean, I was generous with my car, with Susan, because it was our car now. You know, when we think in terms of our, we tend to be generous with those who are part of the we. And actually, it's kind of dumb not to be generous. It's dumb not to share, because if we're part of that we, you know, we're only hurting ourselves by not sharing. So when we talk about ourselves as the body of Christ, we're talking about unity, and we're also talking about generosity in the body, sharing, because it just makes sense. Now, how apparently the early church did this, it says no one had private ownership. No one said my or my. And it goes on to say that there was not a needy person among them for if anybody had need, those who had a house or a field sold it, gave the proceeds, brought the proceeds to the disciples, laid it at their feet, and the disciples distributed it. What they think was going on here is that when they saw somebody in the church that needed something, somebody said, well, I have more than I need, and I will sell it. And then giving it to the apostles for them to distribute was saying, we trust the apostles and we acknowledge their authority to distribute it justly and fairly and wisely. You know, we do that every Sunday here. We do it every Sunday. You give of what you have, and in a sense, it is laid at the feet of Colleen and me, and you trust us to distribute it wisely and justly and fairly. You know? That practice of the early church is acted out every Sunday here. You know? Now, when I think about unity, and um, generosity. I think it's pretty easy to have unity and generosity with people I like. You know, it's easy to like what I like. It's almost impossible not to like what I like. So it's easy for me to have unity with people 
who think like me. And it's easy for me to have generosity with people I know and people who look like me and smell like me and dress like me because I assume we have the same values. It's hard to have unity and generosity with people who are not like me. It's hard in our country to have unity, isn't it, between red and blue? Because we don't think alike. We can't even listen to each other. Unity is almost impossible with people who don't think like me. And it's hard to have generosity with people I might not trust. We don't have it in our country. We don't have it in the United Methodist Church, although we say we're united. For we have trouble being united to, with people who are unlike us, who are oriented differently than us. The trick, it seems to me, is to have unity and generosity with those who are not like us. And that's hard. That's hard. We're experiencing, um, I don't know what the word would be, um, a situation in our church, and we have been for about the last two weeks, where some homeless people have been sleeping on the porch um, between the uh, parlor and the chapel. And um, they're stretching some of our... uh, comfort zones. And I've gotten to know one of the the people, uh, Billy, and trying to find him a place to live and so on, but sometimes his friends stretch the boundaries and I've had to talk with him about his friends and their behavior. (laughs) And one, one day Billy said to me, I know, John, I know, and I've told them they can't come on our property anymore. (laughs) And I thought, that's kind of neat. That's kind of neat. It's our property, you know? But we're still working at the issue of unity and generosity for people who are clearly not like us. And what I'm finding with me is it takes grace. It takes a grace that sometimes I don't have. Sometimes it takes a great grace. And when I think about the behavior of the apostles, after Easter, Luke says, and they gave testimony to the resurrection with great power and great grace. And I think it does take great grace to be united with those who don't think like me. And it takes great grace for me to be generous in the midst of scarcity and to share of my abundance. And I think the resurrection is about God showing great grace. Great grace in forgiving those who killed Jesus. Great grace in taking back 
those who betrayed Jesus, those who denied him, those who fled. To overcome what separates us takes an extraordinary love and an extraordinary forgiveness. I've been reading uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, The Soul of Black Folk. It's a really good book, uh, written in 1903, and it pretty much nails the race issues in our country today. He talks about a black leader who was born in 1819 and died in the 1890s. He talked about his life as a slave and through the Civil War and through Jim Crow. And he says Alexander was tempted with hatred and despair and doubt. But he showed great grace and didn't act on hatred or despair or doubt, but acted with love and care for all. And I thought, you know, we all are tempted with hatred, with despair, and with doubt. To hate the person unlike us, to despair of the world ever getting better, and to doubt in the goodness of our neighbors and of ourselves. But great grace overcomes that and creates unity in the midst of diversity and generosity in the midst of poverty. Story is told of a, um, of a religious denomination in the 1900s that was very adamant teetotalers, absolutely opposed to, to drinking. And uh, some of the church leaders and their bishop were on a missionary uh, tour, I think it was of Africa, and they were invited to the chief's uh, lodge, and, and uh, the chief offered them wine. And the people in the church, in the entourage, kept saying, oh, we would never, never drink wine. We would never let that touch our lips. And the, the, sh the chief was you know, noticeably hurt that his offer of generosity was, was denied and scorned. And the bishop said, I would like a drink. And the bishop drank the wine with the chief. And as they left the hut, the church people were very, very offended and called the bishop on the carpet. How, how, you man of God, how can you be our leader after letting wine pass your lips? Why did you do that? And he said, because one of us had to act like a Christian. One of us had to show great grace. When I think of the apostles and acts, I think of great preachers, long sermons, prayers, healing, But in this story, none of that is mentioned. It's just mentioned that they had unity and generosity. And I think, well, some of us don't have confidence in our praying. Some of us don't have confidence in our preaching. And some of us, if we had the gift of healing, would we look like we do? That was a joke. Um, <laughs> But we all have the gift of grace given us by God in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we all 
can work and show grace in unity and in generosity with those unlike us. So I think back to Easter afternoon. Has anything changed? Did anything happen? And I think, well, it did change. God gave us great grace. And if there's going to be a change in my life, it's up to me. May it be so. Amen.